Can I say thanks very much for coming in to talk to us. Um, you give of your time very freely, uh, I notice. Um, your home isn't far from here, and you work, obviously, you go to London, do your thing, fly back. But the amount of time that you put into the community around you, by, through, through your support, effectively, through the spoken word, through being here today, it's quite unusual to see that higher level coming from a man who would have done as much as you did in film, and maybe come here for a quiet rest. How do you view your place in the community in that regard then? I think there are two, if, if it's, it's a nice thing to ponder, I think maybe two reasons. One is I came here 26 years ago seeking a community. Interesting enough, it's a direct result of a movie. Uh, when I finished Local Hero, I, had, I loved it. But I also loved what the film was about, I loved the ethos, so I loved everything about it. It's my favourite of all the films I've, I've, I've produced. And I thought, you know what, that, that's, that kind of community must be accessible somewhere. And I went up and down the, the west coast of Scotland for a while and couldn't find what I was looking for, particularly in terms of geography, there's a whole series of issues. You can't get property that, but, that abuts the sea in Scotland. You've always got the bloody road down the, down the west coast. And my very first day on holiday here in 88, I stumbled across, and when I mean stumbled across, I really mean stumbled across uh, the place that became my home. So first of all, there's that. So I was, I was consciously seeking community. I was at a point in my life where that's what I wanted and needed. But I think needed as much as anything else. The other is, it's a two-way street. I learn as much from being an active member of this community about what works and what doesn't work, about what's possible and what isn't possible, than I, could, than I ever give. So it, it really is a, a two-way street. It's rather like just now, you know, I did a, an hour and a half talk about film. It's... The questions are everything. I never, ever, ever talk about my life or anything else in an audience without going away at the end thinking, you know what, that was a really great question. Now, my, my answer was adequate, but what do I really think about that? I totally agree with you. Yeah. If there's something happening, just in that hall, you know, um, if you're doing a public interview or whatever it is, the idea of throwing it out to the audience is the most exciting part for me because invariably the question that comes back is a reflection of who's sitting there yep. and what they think of you or what yep. they think of the film and it's as diverse as that isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well I mean, yesterday I had a very interesting yesterday morning I spoke to the annual meeting of the Irish Local and Regional Newspapers Association and uh, the Q&A was fascinating the nature of the questions was fascinating because it, it kind of reflected their fears for the future their attitude the, the real, real concerns about the digital world and everything else. On the other hand, and I don't know if this has happened to you, in expanding on my speech, I go speak, in expanding on it, I actually literally had a couple of ideas that had not occurred to me before because I was having to answer someone else's concerns. Does that make sense? Yes. It's one thing to imagine what concerns might be, then you actually hear them and you think, okay, that's a really interesting thing. I'll, I'll, and in answering them, this was before I even got in the car and reflected, in answering them, I thought to myself, actually, that's great. Oh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm going to use that in future. That's a really good answer to what was quite a complicated question. So it really is, a point I'm really trying to make here at, at, at too much length, is it is a two-way relationship. Yeah, it's a two-way so. relationship with the community, and I'm in learning mode all the time. The lecture circuit for you and your interest in education would have meant that you'd be travelling, you'd be flying more than you'd be walking, mm -hmm. really, and that wasn't a good thing for you, I think. No. So you said, I'll do something else, which is quite unique. You've built a system that allowed you to communicate. Yeah. It was, again, a bit of luck. I had a, Patsy and I had a, quite a, what could have been a very bad uh, car accident in, in Italy. And what it left me was I had 19 fractures of the, my left arm. Uh, and uh, so I'm at home recovering and feeling pretty sorry for myself. Also thinking about what might have happened. I mean, it could have been much, much worse. We were lucky. Um, and I read, just happened to read about uh, the Cisco telepresence system and, and w what was happening with it. So as soon as I was able to, I went to London and I arranged a, um, a, v a session with them to, to look at what they were doing, what they were developing, where that was going, uh, out near Heathrow actually. And I thought, you know what, this could be an answer. So I contacted a couple of universities that I had connections with and said, look, if I did this, if I, did this, if I could do this, would you be interested? And there was enough interest to reassure me. I borrowed some money. And I took what had been our garage and I, I turned it into a studio, effectively, a broadcast studio, with a lot of help, I've got to say, from both Cisco and BT. BT liked the idea of doing something from this distance and making it work. So 
One of the reasons we chose Brisbane as our first, Griffith University, Bristol as our, uh, as our first university, was it was a way of physically demonstrating what was possible. You could live in West Cork and teach in real time in Brisbane. If you could do that, you could do anything. And oh, that, wonderful. You know. That's great. Yeah. Um, in the making of films and that sort of thing, you've had to have you know, a level of ingenuity or, or problem solving or whatever it is. And that's probably mirrored in you know, post-accident looking at where do I go from here? Yeah. But do you miss the level of intensity that filming involved you, your life, your family? Do you miss that now? Yes and no. Um, almost impossible for a civilian as we used to refer to the rest of the world, to uh, understand what an extraordinary thing it is to be a member of a well-working work, well movie crew on location. You have become a family. You become an alternative family. Uh, and it's, it's, there is something, actually, the only word is beautiful. It's a beautiful, organic thing, especially when you know, the work you're doing is good. It can be horrible when it's going the reverse way, and it often does. But it's a very beautiful thing to be part of. But at the same time, it does have an impact. You know, I've got a fantastic family and my two, my two kids are great. My wife and I have been married for 53 years this year. Uh, but it takes a toll on them. And there was a moment where I looked around at my peer group and realised I was going to go down that road. I was actually possibly endangering a whole lot of other relationships. Mm -hmm. And I had to make a choice. You have, you have to make choices. Uh, and I think I, without any doubt I made, the, I made the right choice. Now that choice was enormously easier by the fact I was offered the, uh, the peerage, I was offered the opportunity to go to the House of Lords and work for the government. So I joined the Department of Education. For six months, I was actually making a movie at the time, for six months I tried to do both and it was clearly impossible. Yeah. Uh, and so suddenly I had to go and I decided to retire. It's a quite sweet story. I didn't tell anybody other than at home. Um, and two years later, Tessa Jowell had become a uh, Secretary of State, and I was doing some stuff for her, and she said to me, don't you think you should let the, your industry know that you, <laughs> you've retired? So we fixed a, a, a lecture at BAFTA. Uh, we came, gave it kind of a fairly grand title, one thing or another, and Tessa turned up. And I used the lecture to mention the fact that actually two years earlier I had, <laughs> I had retired and I'd omitted to tell anyone. And that was the way I broke the news, and happily, no, well, weirdly, no one had noticed. And that tells you something. <laughs> well, you've left a legacy, worrying. I mean, you know, uh, somebody was describing walking into the cinema, your private cinema, and going in and there being in awe of the few BAFTA awards and there's the Oscar and there's another, and there's another. So the measure of what you've been done and doing has been rewarded by gongs, by awards, mm -hmm. by people saying, well done. So it's not as if you haven't achieved, you know, you, you've, you've made a massive difference to the world of film. It's a really interesting point, and the truth is, there was a bit of me that always felt I maybe had been over, not so much overachieved, over rewarded. And I think we're going right back to your earlier question as the community and one thing or another and learning. There's a bit of me that's still trying to square up really? my life. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, I had a period, ten, about a dozen years, where I was colossally rewarded. And, uh, I think if you're a remotely sensitive human being, you kind of, that, that's quite disturbing. Um, you really, really want to feel that you've earned it. Uh, I remember something very vividly. I remember when the Killing Fields, I think probably quite narrowly, didn't win Best Picture in, what are we talking about, 84. It dealt with the problem for me. When Chariots had won the Best Picture, because I've been a film fan all my life, to me the Oscars represented something. It was a type of film that was an Oscar winning movie, you know, Gone with the Wind. And I wasn't entirely sure that Chariots, much as I loved the film, really was that. But when The Killing Fields didn't win, I remember going home and probably chatting to Patsy and saying, you know what, you put the two films together, between them they deserve an Oscar. So in a funny way, I felt much more comfortable about the Oscar two years later when, when Killing Fields didn't win. It may, it may sound really weird, but I, you know, that's me. That's, that's where I come out of. Uh, so, I feel that part and parcel of everything I'm doing at the moment, I'm very conscious of this, the work I'm doing in Dublin, work I'm doing in London, is all part of trying to make sure that when the time comes, I've squared my life up. And that no one can say, well, all he's been is a lucky bugger. I would hate that. What a brilliant uh, 
way to have thought it out for yourself in terms of you know the life you've lived and the, the life ahead of you. You know, you go to bed easier at night, I suppose. Do you? Yeah, I also think I I I kind of hero worship my dad. My dad was a journalist, photojournalist, uh, and I think the most important thing in my my life was to have him be proud of me. And I knew where his values lay, and his values were somewhat old-fashioned, we people think today. And so there's a bit of that, you know, how Dad would have felt. And I'm not alone in that. I've talked to other people who've had exactly that feeling. Mm. Final question has to do with film, and basically, to be listed amongst those who've received the Oscars and to be even nominated for that means a huge thing in terms of the support that you would get from that point on from the industry, that you're in a club of sorts, yeah. that your value rises, that your fees, if you're an actor or whatever, cameraman, that it'll rise. Did that happen to you as you, know, you went along the career path that you did, that once you hit that level, then the funding was there for something bigger, or the, sh the backing that you needed for the next thing was there faster? I th there's an interesting, I mean, I, ha I think I've got an interesting take on this. Uh, and I'm influenced by something I read that Paul Simon said once. I met him actually once, and uh, I can't remember whether I read it or he said it to me. He may have even said it. Um, he told me that when he was working at the Troubadour, which was a club in London, as a very young man, the owner came to him and said, you know, Paul, this is really great. You've been here several months. Uh, the number of tables we're selling, the business we're doing has really gone up. It's so uh, and he gave him a raise, doubled his salary. He was getting 50 pounds a week and he suddenly gave him £100 a week. Now, £100 a week in 1960, what we were talking about, 66, 65, 66, yeah. was a lot of money. And he said, you know, it was the first and only time in my life where I'd been paid exactly what I was worth. He said, prior to that, I was always being exploited, and after that, I was always earning more money than I could ever possibly justify. So he said, that wonderful, wonderful moment where it was all in balance. Well, I had that on Local Hero. Prior to, um, <clears throat> well, for example, prior to Midnight Express, I never earned a living wage at all as a producer. In fact, I earned the same amount as my, as pr for producing Midnight Express as the previous 10 movies before it. Okay, so Midnight Express, I was, I was getting at least a decent, a decent salary. Charity Supply, I did all right. Local Hero was the first time where I went into a movie feeling my budget was sufficient to pull off the script, that I was being paid a proper wage, uh, where I felt good about how I was, and, uh, and all of that. From that point onwards, probably, if anything, I was maybe marginally overpaid. Um, but I'm not complaining because that's left me with a pension. And I couldn't have made the decision in 97 I made to um, do the work I do had I not done that. So actually, it kind of has worked out. So yeah, there was a period from, let's say, 87 to 97 where I was earning more than uh, was wholly justifiable. On the other hand, the investment of those years has allowed me for the next, what, 30 years now almost. And it uh, kind of rewarded 20, you for what you put in before that as well, years. in your own way. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, more, it's more to do with the fact that I can do what I can do now as a result of, of those, those, uh, that period, that, that 10 year period has funded me for the next 20 years. Well, we've kept you for 10 minutes of that live so far. <laughs> I just want to thank you so much for coming in and saying hello. Thank it's you. a great, great pleasure, honestly.